the African tour over to uh, the motherland? No, not the college tour. I wasn't able to do it this year. I'm going to try to do it next summer. And once we get the school open, we're going to be doing several of them every year because we need to do them for our own students. But I also want to allow other African boys and girls to benefit from that tour. It's actually, it's the thing that I love the most to do that college tour, college and consciousness tour, because we take them to different universities, but then we also take them to different historic and sacred sites of our people. So we'll go to Harriet Tubman grave, Frederick Douglass grave, Harriet Tubman house, <laughs> Great Blacks of Wax, Benjamin Danica home, Nat Turner Lane. You know, places that they've never been and they never get a chance to go to again. So we'll do that and then we'll go to the HBCU. Most HBCU tours only do colleges. They don't do the black experience. We do the black experience plus college. So it's extra and I'm the tour guide. So they getting it straight from Dr. Umar no filter. You know, it's life changing. So um, I, I'm definitely uh, going to be doing one next spring. But what I'm working on for this fall and winter, I will announce I'm working on one for adults because I've had so many adults hit me up and say, Doc, I want to go on one. I mean, I'm past college. I'm not going to college, but that's just part of our history. I would like to visit these colleges and learn about how they got started and what they have to offer. And I want to go to Nat Turner Land. I want to go to the Great Blacks in Wax. I want to go to the Frederick Douglass Home. You know, so I'm putting together a, it'll be a week-long tour for 18 and older, it'll be for adults. So if somebody want to bring their wife, you know, wife want to bring a husband, you want to bring the children, it could be for any age, but it'll be, you know, primarily for the adults, but we will allow some children. And this will be an opportunity for adults to just kick back and get that experience too, because a lot of people never got that growing up. They were never taken to these places. They never even knew that they were still being kept or that these things even happened. And it's our, it's our obligation to show them. So I'm working on, on working on the adult tour as well. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. Now I got another question for you. How now? This is a big topic. How do you feel about black men and black women relationships, man? You know, because I see a, a division starting to happen amongst the family. So black males and black females are not just coming together anymore. Like, and I see a lot of uh, dating outside their race. Mm -hmm. starting to take place. How you feel about all that, man? Right. Well, it's all economically driven. Or should I say it's mm -hmm. predominantly economically driven. The black community was led by two parent households until 1970. You can check the statistics. We were married through slavery. We were married through Reconstruction. We were married through Jim Crow. We were married through the Garvey movement. We were married through civil rights. We were married through black power. You don't see the rise of a single parented female-headed household until 1970. And that was delivered after they murdered King two years before. They decided to economically neutralize the black community so we could not fund another serious movement. Let me repeat that. They decided to economically neutralize the black community to make sure we could never fund another serious movement because most of the movements of the 60s, integrationists and nationalists, were funded by blacks, not the government. So what they did was they came into the inner cities and they took out the industrial building trade programs from the high schools. They took out carpentry. They took out plumbing. They mm -hmm. took out electric. They took out auto body. They took out welding. They took it out to make sure black men would no longer be equipped with the skills that pay the bills. If you remember, before 1980, they did not send everybody to college. College wasn't even talked about that much in the black community before 1980. After 1980, they would push college exclusively and to the detriment of earning your building tree license. This was on purpose. And then they took out all of the industrial jobs. They deindustrialized the inner city. If you drive to Philadelphia now, you see the remains of corporate factory type buildings. So many different factory jobs was in Philadelphia, Detroit, Michigan, probably yeah. even in Tulsa as well. That's where yeah. our grandfathers work. That's where our grandmoms work. They now turn those factories into what? Drug rehabs and prisons. Where you yeah. used to work it is now where you go to be incarcerated. You see? So they de-industrialized the black community. And then 1980, they dropped off the crack. So 1970, they made the black man economically irrelevant to the black woman. Let me say that one more time. The yeah. whole black on black thing is about making the black man economically irrelevant irrelevant to the black woman. And then in the 1980s, they dropped off the crack and started sending black men to prison, which means the mother was at home alone. 
And then they came with the welfare. And let me be clear, welfare programs were not started in the 70s and 80s, okay, to help black women take care of the kids because the father was locked up. They could give a damn about the kids. Welfare programs, and they were real before the 70s and 80s, but they were intensified in the 70s and 80s because they wanted to make sure that a black woman did not join forces with her incarcerated man against the system of white supremacy. Let me say it again. The reason they gave the black woman food stamps and public housing and public medical care isn't because they cared about her or her kids. They did it to make sure she didn't unite with the black man against the white power structure. That's why they created welfare. And then in the 90s, Bill Clinton came with his crime bill, the most revolutionized mass incarceration plan since Reconstruction. You see, that's how they decimated the community. Listen, you may never solve black male-female relationship problems until you deal with the economics. If there is no finance, there will be no romance. You cannot tell a man to stay with your woman if the woman won't let him stay because he cannot pay the bills. That's exactly. Mm -hmm. You have to make him a livable wage earner. And that's why I hate these conversations about crime. What is their response to crime? Put more cops on the street, build more jails. Now, can you show me any criminology, sociology, psychology study that shows more cops and more prisons reduces crime? Have you ever heard that anyway? No, you haven't. So if we know more cops and more jails doesn't reduce crime, why aren't we putting that money into jobs and training for black men instead of hiring more white cops and building more white jails? Because America is not interested in helping the black man survive. America is only interested in the black man's elimination. Hmm. If black men are going to be saved, which means the black family is going to be saved, it must be saved by black people. Wow. That's very if true. If you don't deal with the economic irrelevancy of the black man in the black woman's life, you'll never fix the, you'll never fix the black male female relationship issue because we're the only men in this country who are out earned and out educated by our women. We're the That's only true. ones. The black mm-hmm. woman is the only woman who out earns and out educates a man because so many of our sisters have bought into the feminist narrative. They blame him for not having been in jail. They blame him for not being able to get a job. They walk into the white man's school aid that says the reason your man can't make what you make, the reason you have the education you have, and the reason he can't stay out of jail is because he's an irresponsible Negro. When the truth of the matter is you designed the society in which he lives to destroy him. Listen, mm. if I control the economics and the education of any community, I can make criminals out of anybody I want. Put me in charge of the European Jewish community and give me control of their schools and their jobs. Put me in charge of the Mexican community and give me control of their schools and their jobs. Put me in charge of the Chinese community and give me control of their schools and their jobs, not to mention their criminal justice system, Mm. and I'll make an inmate out of anybody I want. Criminals are not born. They are made by criminal communities. Yep. You're right. Mm-hmm. You're right about that. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. so. Which is because why right now we're in the midst of a political season where everybody's gearing up for the presidential season. And everybody's right. asking about Corey Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. Unfortunately, we live in the same city where our schools are going to be. And mm-hmm. I'm telling people that I got three questions for all of them. And none of them are going to give me an answer. Question number one, what are you going to do about police genocide? None of them have an answer. Question number two, what are you going to do about black people having economic access to wealth? They don't have an answer. Number three, what are you going to do about mass incarceration? They don't have an answer. Number four, what are you going to do about gentrification? They don't have an answer. The problems that affect black people the most, none of your candidates, Republican or Democrat, have an answer. So I will not be casting a vote. Mm. Mm. My vote is not cheap. Some people got a cheap vote. See, when you walk into a store and the store don't have the type of food you want, you don't buy the food. You go find a store that got the food you got. And if you can't find it, you'll wait till you find the food you need. That's how Negroes do. 
when they go shopping for a president, they say, damn, none of these presidents are really what I want. But I've been told that if I don't vote, I'm disrespecting my ancestors. So I got to vote for somebody. Get the hell out of here. Your ancestors don't want you voting for people who ain't going to do nothing for you. That is a damn scare tactic invented by the black bourgeoisie to influence black folks to keep them in office after they've done nothing for you the previous four years. My vote is extremely important to me, and I only get it, I only get it when I have good reason to. Mm-hmm. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I'm speechless on that one. Yeah. Because I've always been a firm believer that, that it's, especially this 2020 election coming up, we need to get out in droves. Let me ask you this. How do you feel about Trump, Dr. Umar? Well, Donald, listen, every president in American history, from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln to Barack Obama to, to Donald Trump have been enemies of black folk. Not one of them has done anything significant to help I don't, we got to stop getting up and we got to stop getting caught up in personality. Donald Trump as a man is irrelevant. The president of the United States is an institution. It is not a personality. Donald Trump is an employee. He is not an employer. He takes orders. Just like Barack Obama took orders. Just like George Bush took orders. Bill Clinton took orders. George Bush took orders. You don't create your policy as president. You're told what to do. This ain't about Donald Trump. It is about the United States government as an institution that represents the will and intent of white folks. That's what it's about. We have to divorce ourselves from this political analysis of personalities. The personalities are irrelevant. It is the agenda, and that agenda is prepared before the president even takes office. <laughs> Donald Trump is doing what he was told to do. And the next president, whether it's Corey, Kamala, Bernie, or Joe, will do what they're told to do. This is why I'm not interested in black politicians either. I don't need no black president. I don't need no black mayor, no black governor, because they don't do nothing for us. And why don't they do anything for us? Because they're part of the Democratic Party. How can a black person who belongs to the Democratic Party, to whom they pledge loyalty, carry out a black agenda when you belong to a party that's racist? You see? So the only candidate that can do anything for black people would have to be an independent candidate. You get a couple of them, but you don't get many of them. Because most black people think they got to be a Democrat in order to win. That's how afraid we are. We think you got to have the white man's validation in order to get elected. And once you get his validation and you get his money, he owns your ass. That's why we don't have a free black politician in America. Not one of them is free. They talk that black talk when they get around us. And so when they get around the white folks, they dance to the tune. Are you not aware that there has been a direct inverse relationship? between the amount of black politicians who get elected and the condition of black people. The more black people get put in office, the worse off we do. And that's why under Obama, we did the worst we did in 50 years. Under Barack Obama, every measure of black success went down. Everyone. Graduation went down. Business ownership went down. Mass incarceration went up. And everybody talking about how great of a president he was. If he was so great, why can't you give me one thing he did for black folks? I can give you three things he did for homosexuals. I can give you three things he did for illegal immigrants. I can give you three things he did for women. You can't give me one thing he did for black folks because Barack Obama was a white man's president, not a black man's president. And you know what's sad about it? We still can't see that even though he's out of office. Because black people have a policy of falling in love with politicians. That's why we need new political education. You don't fall in love with politicians. They are for sale. Politicians are commodities. You buy them, you trade them, you sell them, you don't fall in love with them. And that's why we can't never get nowhere, because we got to like people in order to vote for them. Got to like them. That's what black people say. I'm going to vote for them because I like them. You don't know what his policies are. You don't know yep. what his agenda is. You don't yeah, right know his campaign. All you know is I like him. And because I like him, I'm going to vote for him. Now, the guy you don't like might be the one you need. The guy mm. you don't like might be the one you need, but he's not attractive. He's not charismatic. He ain't got no swag. And he tells black people what they want to hear, and they don't want to hear that. So the person you needed never gets in office, and the person you didn't need will always win. And a lot of that comes from the fact that we are under a black Christian ethos domination. The black community is run by the charismatic preacher. So when we go to vote, we take that, that church energy into the voting box, and then we vote for the most charismatic candidate. And unfortunately, charisma is often a blessing 
bestowed upon those who are least deserving of it. 